Okay, we'll get started as people start to funnel in. So welcome to new treatment updates for TGCT. During this webinar, all participants will be in a listen only mode. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentations using questions submitted with our Q&A feature. Please remember this information provided in the webinar is not intended as a substitute for your physician's guidance and care. My name is Sydney Stern. I am the Director of Giant Cell Tumor Programs, and I am your moderator for today. We would like to thank our sponsors for today's webinar, Daichi Sanko and Decipher Pharmaceuticals. I would like to introduce our panelists today. We'll start with Gina, uh, Dr. Gina Diamato. Dr. Diamato is a board certified medical oncologist specializing in sarcoma at the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center at University of uh, Miami. She received a BS in biology and her MD is from University of Miami. Her residency was at Jackson Memorial Hospital at University of Miami as well. She completed her fellowship in hematology and oncology at Moffitt Cancer Center and Research Institute. And during her fellowship, Dr. Diamato began in specializing in sarcoma. Prior to her current job at University of Miami, she was with Georgia Cancer Specialists and a faculty at Moffitt and also at Emory. And second, we have Dr. Breland Wilkie. Dr. Wilkie is the Director of Sarcoma Medical Oncology at University of Colorado Medical Campus in Aurora, Colorado. Dr. Wilkie received her undergrad degree in biology and music from Bates College in Lewiston, Maine, and attended medical school at University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, which is also now Rutgers Medical School. She received her MD with distin uh, distinguishing in uh, research, and she then completed the ulcer in internship and residency in internal medicine at John Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland and stayed there to complete her fellowship in medical oncology. And so I will give them the floor and stop sharing. Okay, go ahead. And so I just wanna um, thank you so much uh, for, as are you guys seeing this? Um, hold on one second. And, uh, I'll put my slides on. Um, so I just wanna thank um, Life Raft Group for giving me this opportunity um, to speak to you tonight. I'm gonna to try to make it less um, lecture and more question and answer. So we don't run out of time to have all the questions. We got really amazing questions. Um, um, and so I'm gonna be going back and forth with Dr. Wilkie. Um, so you won't just get bored of me. You can go back and forth and uh, we'll, we'll share the hot seat tonight. So uh, again, honored to be here. And I did use the slides. We didn't wanna reinvent the wheel. So um, Sydney did an amazing job with slides in a previous webinar. Um, so, you know, there's a full deck uh, available to you. Um, so I've kind of just taken the highlights to talk about TGCT. So what does it stand for? Tenosynovial giant cell tumor. So what's the tenosynovial? It's the connection between the uh, tendon and the synovium, which is the joint. So it's benign, meaning neoplasm, meaning that it's a tumor, benign meaning it's not cancer, does not have the ability to spread through the bloodstream, um, but it's called a locally aggressive tumor. So what's the difference between hey, that? Hey, Dr. Jim, uh, yeah. uh, you're sharing different slides. Oh, I'm sorry, where am I? Okay, I'm sharing different slides. Which slides am I sharing? You're sharing currently, uh, it looks like the flyer. Oh, oops, that's kind of weird. I'm so sorry. Okay, what about this? Um, is it, is this, is this it or no? No, you may wanna bring down your stop sharing and then bring it up and then hit share. Okay, screen share. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, round round two, sorry about that. Uh, are you guys seeing this? Yep, we see it. I did steal the flyer as the, okay, so again, you, great. okay. So again, um, there's overlapping between this and cancer. Um, TGCT is not always fast 
it, but it can locally invade into area. It very rarely metastasizes, means spread to other areas, but it can put stress on the bones and tissues and joints. Cancer is usually aggressive and can spread and can be more life-threatening if it's spread to important organs and, um, and can dissolve and invade in healthy tissue. And then in the middle, there's kind of overlapping. Um, and, and so there's no distinct borders. It can be fast growing and it can be treated with some of the cancer treatments, um, which I call a molecularly targeted therapy. Um, so what causes it? Most causes are pretty much are unknown, okay? Um, I have found nice people, so I don't know if that has anything to do with anything, but it is very nice people. Um, it's a little bit um, more common in women, and the average is about anywhere from 30 to 40 years old. And so far, we don't know any environmental, geographic, occupational, dietary lifestyles. So um, if there were anyone, if there were, we should have noticed by now, but of course, when patients are enrolled in clinical trials, we ask questionnaires and we may be able to find a link, but at this point, we do not have a link. So it used to be called pigmented villonodular synovitis. Whenever you see itis, that means inflammation. So um, it used to be called that. So if you ever see PVNS, now you know it's the same thing like uh, formerly known as, right? Again, uh, it arises from the synovium joints and the majority of cells are actually not neoplastic. Neoplastic means tumor or cancer. So the majority of cells that we see in the microscope are actually a lot of inflammatory cells because we know that there's a certain gene mutation in the colony, colony stimulating factor, the CSF1 gene that's mutated and causes this these cells to be activated, okay, and brings on inflammatory cells. So usually it presents with pain, swelling, range of mo limited range of mo motion and stiffness. And again, it usually it can occur around hands or but knees are the most common site. And um, slight female predominance, and it's about one in uh, 43 cases per million. And it could be either localized to a single area or diffuse type, which can be infiltrative and locally aggressive. So, um, and so um, basically um, here, uh, the giant, we're not gonna talk about giant cell tumor of the bone. This is of the tendon sheet. So their connective tissue arise in the tendon sheath or synovium. And so there's different kinds of inflammatory cells, immune cells that get that are part of the tumor that are causing the symptoms and the inflammation. And so these monocytes or macrophages are part of the ones that we can actually see in the tumor. Whereas other tumors, you can just see the abnormal connective tissue cells. But here you can see part of the immune system. So what's the difference between diffuse and localized? Diffuse usually affects larger joints like um, knees um, they don't have a distinct boundary. They're larger. There's, they could be multiple. They tend to be more aggressive and they have a higher recurrence. The localized, usually smaller, maybe in the hands. Distinct boundary, usually smaller than two centimeters. Single tumor, less aggressive. And it's unlikely that the tumor will recur after surgery. So the majority actually are localized, but of course we're we have new medicines for the diffuse type so that, and the diffuse type are the ones that are more problematic. So of course we think diffuse is more common, but really um, localized we never hear about because patients get it out and then they never have to worry about it again. So there's about 1500 cases of diffuse um, diagnosed each year. So this is just a comparison to giant cell tumor of the bone, which is totally different. Um, and so, Again, majority around the knees, it can be the hips, fingers, shoulders, but about 75% occur in the, around the knee. So, you know, um, we got a list of patient questions. So we're gonna be integrating them into our lectures. So what are systemic treatment options? Um, surgery, radiation, systemic therapy, what are the treatment options? So I'm gonna go over a little bit and then we'll have Dr. Wilkie take over. So surgical interventions. 
So surgery is the mainstay of treatment, okay? So if someone's newly diagnosed with a TGCT, surgery is the mainstay. Um, and it, you have to remove the inflamed joint and the lining of the tissue. They can either do an or arthroscope using a camera or they have to open it. So when you ever see scopy, that means camera. Scopic or scopy is using a camera. Otomy or ectomy means open removal, okay? Of the inflamed joint and the synovial tissue. And so, and sometimes they have to do joint replacements or ankle fusions. Um, uh, rarely uh, in the past, we would do, uh, we would have some patients need amputations. Now, since we have better treatments, we try to avoid these very aggressive approaches. So uh, again, the surgery, um, they can do arthroscopy just using a hole or they do open. And currently it's the standard of care. Do, is it open or, or the camera? Um, you know, that's still in, um, that's still debatable depending on the size and the surgeon and where it's located. And again, the recurrence rate is low if it's localized and much higher if it's diffuse. And so when is surgery no longer an option? Okay, so, um, and this is, um, you know, if tuners are considered inoperable due to the extent of disease or the recurrence has occurred, there's no standard. So essentially, um, you know, essentially what happens is that you have to remember this is a localized um, tumor that um, can cause decrease in quality of life. And so, but surgery can leave permanent damage. So it's a delicate balance between the if you want, you can always do surgery, but then is it going to leave a permanent um, disfiguration, deformity, or uh, decrease of um, uh, function, okay? And so that's when we try to use alternative therapies, such as systemic therapies, when the surgery is going to deem, is going to leave someone with a permanent situation. So um, again, um, so we have, and Dr. Wilkie's going to go over the surgery, but again, um, the, the other treatments, but um, surgery is the primary treatment. And then in the past, because we learned about that the CSF receptor is mutated, that imatinib that was originally um, uh, um, studied in a different cancer, CML and GIST, which is... Um, which is a type of sarcoma, the most common type of sarcoma. Matinib is very effective, it, and but it can also inhibit the CSF. And so it was initially studied in TGCT, and you can get some tumor shrinkage about 20% of the time. Another drug, nilotinib, was tested, but it really didn't pan out as well as the imatinib. And then we're going to talk about pexidartinib. Um, and Dr. Wilkie's going to go over that, but that's the one drug we have that's FDA approved for patients that are unable to get surgery again. So again, it's the most common, but there's increasing role to try to see if we can add something to it. And we have to, you know, be every patient is, um, we have to take one patient at a time. So again, the treatment options, what's the best way? What's, is it best to wait for surgery to monitor? How do you guys monitor the tumors before and after treatment? How many surgeries is too much? And is there criteria to switch to drugs? So, you know, when do you treat? Okay, so again, TGCT is not life-threatening, but it's quality of life-threatening, right? So how do we, how does it affect the quality of life? And these were some questionnaires that were done. Um, how are you having problems walking? What about tying your shoelaces? How does this, how does it limit you going outside? How does it, how does it limit you doing daily activities? Are you having problems pushing things? All these activities, how much is this tumor affecting your life? And the more it affects your life, the more likely you're going to want to have treatment. What about laundry, standing up, bending, kneeling, stooping, are you able to exercise? And so um, 
how we how we measure the how we measure is using so first we want to use a, a a scale we use the Kramis scale which is basically talking about pain talking about stiffness talking about your activity level we want to have the baseline of that and then we also want to use MRI as the best imaging modality so it's a combination of the two and we by using tumor volume where we circle around, which I'll show you, around the tumor, that's the best way to image it. So we use the tumor volume and the symptoms. And then that's, we have the baseline. And then as you're on treatment, we monitor that. We monitor the symptoms, which is easy to do, right? We just ask you questions. And then the MRIs, we want to get every about three to six months, maybe initially three months, and then as time goes by, we can go every six months. Um, but really it's gonna be quality of life. Is this, is this treatment improving your quality of life or is it not? Okay, so here's um, an example. So when we have clinical trials, um, we use where we just measure the longest diameter. Um, so that's the rhesus criteria, but you see this tumor is irregular in shape. So it doesn't really give us a good response of how we can, um, you know, de how, how, is it really working? But if we can calculate the, the volume by drawing it, then we can use different standards to try to see how well it's working. So if something's working, it would decrease by rhesus by 30%, but, it, but for the volume, you're, you're measuring more. So we would want it to be decreased by 50%. And then if it's not working, it would increase by 30%. Um, so I think we'll have Dr. Wilkie talk a little bit more about the treatments that we have, and then I'll come back and talk about some of the more questions, clinical trials, et cetera. And I'm gonna stop sharing. Thanks for that great introduction. Um, so I'm having a couple of technical difficulties, but I'm going to see if I can manage to share. If you want, I can share yours if you want, if I have, if you need me to. Uh, let me try this. Yeah, this is just really weird. Yeah, do you mind sharing? I think it'll- Yeah, let me get your slides real quick. Actually, you know what? I'm not gonna be able to see them. Yeah, it's really it's really bizarre um, what's happening, but let me try to do this real quick. Um, and then... I also have them pulled up if you need. Oh, do you wanna share them then or? Yeah, why don't you guys share them and then I'll I'll just narrate and I'll go next slide because I can't I can't actually see the slides right now. Just okay, and I can totally. Share okay, it. okay. Sorry for the technical difficulties. So we should be on. We're blaming slide. it on the weather. I don't know what's going on. It's <laughs> Zoom problems, but it's great to see everybody and to have everyone here. And thank you so much again for inviting me to be part of this. So just let me know when you have the the slide up. Can you not see my slides? I can't see anything. Yeah, that's the problem. So it's up. It's live. Okay. Perfect. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit now about some of the therapies um, that we can use for TGCT or PBNS, which is the old name. They're both really, really long. So pick your favorite acronym and go from there. Um, but basically, this all comes down to a problem with a protein called CSF1 or colony stimulating factor one. So this picture kind of shows a little bit about what's going on in the tumor, in the PBNS tumor that's within a joint space in most cases. So you have tumor cells there clearly, but what people often don't recognize is a lot of what we can see on MRIs and certainly a lot of what causes symptoms and problems is inflammatory cells or macrophages primarily, which are shown on the right side there in yellow. And macrophages like to follow CSF1 like crazy. It's like a homing beacon for them. In PV and, or I'm sorry, TGCT tumor cells, um, the main genetic problem is that there are two genes that are supposed to be miles away from each other 
that somehow get flip-flopped and stuck together ne like next door neighbors. And when they do that, they take on the ability to, to continue to generate each other um, indefinitely. And so one of the partners in that genetic flip-flop in PVNS cells or PGCT cells is CSF1 plus a protein called collagen 6A3. So what's important to know is that that binding of those two proteins leads to tons of CSF1 being produced by the TGCT tumor cells. Um, and you can see that here, which then causes CSF1 to draw in all of those inflammation cells. So there's two things, basically you're drawing in macrophages from the CSF1 coming from the tumor cells and the CSF1 also acts as a continued growth stimulator to the tumor cells themselves. So it's two problems all because of CSF1. So we can go to the next slide. So the idea is if we can block CSF1 or the receptor, which was that little antenna that's designed to pick up the CSF1 and carry on the signals, then we should be able to slow not only the tumor growth um, in TGCT, but also the inflammation from the macrophages that comes with it. And so these are our more modern therapies um, or what we talk about for medical therapies for this disease. And you can see here a list of several uh, strategies to block CSF1 or the receptor partner. Um, some of you may have heard of um, antibodies. So antibodies are proteins that serve to bind to CSF1, just like our COVID antibodies, right? That neutralize the virus. Antibodies bind and neutralize CSF1 or the receptor so that the signaling doesn't happen. And a couple of examples um, that I'm showing here are MCS110, which is an old drug um, from Novartis uh, that was tr in trials for several years and then kind of fizzled out a little bit. And I don't personally know the most current status or how much interested that one is in moving forward. And then a new one that was um, just reported on um, in an early study, which we'll look at more, um, called Cabiralizumab. I can't even say it, Cabiralizumab. I didn't name these things, it's crazy. But that one also is an antibody that blocks the receptor. Um, now there's also chemo pills, what we call small molecule inhibitors. And these basically block the receptor. Think of it like a puzzle piece that kind of fits into that gap um, on the receptor and stops CSF1 from being able to get into its place. It sort of sits there and interferes with everything. So there are three drugs that we'll talk about today that are these kind, that are receptor um, oral pills. One is actually Gleevec or Imatinib. It's a partial inhibitor of CSF1. It is not as specific or sensitive to binding that receptor as the other ones. Um, Pexidartinib, Teralio is the other name for it. And a new kit on the block, DCC3014, which doesn't have a fancy name yet, um, that is in clinical trials right now. And so the, again, the idea of these treatments is number one, block the growth stimulation to the tumor cells and hopefully starve them so they die, but also to block the inflammation that comes from the migrating uh, macrophages. Uh, next slide. So now we'll get into some of your questions. Um, so first thing, are these drugs still considered chemotherapies? So chemotherapy gets a bad rap, but really in general terms, it basically means a medicine that's designed to kill cancer cells or rapidly growing cells. So these are fancier treatments. These are what we call targeted therapies, which implies that instead of being a bomb that kills any cells that grow fast, like traditional chemo that we use for other types of cancer or even sarcomas, um, this really is a very specific target. It's a, it's a missile that's only going to take out a particular target. And so targeted therapies in general are still considered chemo, but it's different than IV chemotherapies where you lose your hair and things like that. Um, next slide. Can these drugs be given as preventatives? That's the next question. So, you know, we, we typically for diseases that are not life-threatening, so meaning a disease that is like TGCT where we know in almost all cases there's no spread to other locations and there is no danger of causing death from organ involvement. Um, you know, we, we are very careful in that risk and benefit balance. And we'll talk about side effects here in a minute. But in general, there are some patients where after surgery, it could be years before their TGCT flares up enough where they need more therapy. 
And so, you know, you don't really know where you fall on that curve, um, but you certainly could use them if you're so sure that there's leftover tumor there, or, or if you've had a very quick recurrence or having your TGCT come back after a prior surgery, but it's, it's a risk benefit balance that you need to talk about with your doctor. Next slide. So let's talk about the side effects a little bit. Um, so what I've done here is make a complicated chart that's a little tricky to follow, but these are sort of my top 10 or so side effects that are most commonly reported with these families of drugs with CSF1 targets. Um, so right here, you'll see on the first, I'm sorry, on the second column, you'll see um, cabirolizumab, which is the antibody. I have imatinib, pexidartinib, and then DCC3014, just for example. So the common side effects that people talk about are hair color changes. This is much more common in PEXI um, than imatinib, for example, and wasn't reported um, so far with 3014 or Kabira. Nausea vomiting, so higher with imatinib in most cases, um, about 20% in both of the oral chemo pills. And again, not a problem so much with the antibody, which is, it makes sense, you're taking a pill, there's, it's in your stomach, it's in your GI tract and may cause more issues that way. Fatigue across the board, this is, this is definitely reported when you're treating um, this disease, can be higher up to 70% in trials for imatinib um, and about 40 to 50% with our more focused CSF1 pills, um, pexidartinib and DCC. Liver enzymes. So we'll talk about this more on the next slide, but this is the one that really got people worried about pexidartinib. Um, your liver is designed to neutralize toxins. Um, and when you use drugs that are irritating to it, it will start spitting out these enzymes that are a sign of stress or inflammation. So imatinib does this um, intermittently as well. Um, there's about a 5% chance of, of significant or severe damage to the liver, um, even with imatinib, which is used for, for cancers. However, pexidartinib in looking at a benign disease, the concern was that there was about a 10% risk of severe liver issues um, with this drug, which is why there was so much concern about whether or not to approve this drug for a benign TGCT diagnosis. So DCC um, is very early on. So, you know, they were very hopeful that this drug could potentially be better for the liver. And the data that I'm pulling here, this is from the CTOS um, presentation in November of last year, certainly look promising, but this is a handful of patients. So that's why these bigger trials are ongoing to, is to get a better understanding of what these side effects are gonna look like. So hopefully this will be better, but um, still about 28% of patients will have some degree of liver inflammation. Other ones, taste changes, headaches, swelling, particularly around the eyes, the joints in the body. Um, you know, Gleevec definitely does this, but definitely we get it's that with the CSF1 family in general increased creatine kinase. So this is a muscle enzyme um, that is normally cleared by these fancy cells in your liver called Kupfer cells, which get shut down by these drugs. And so almost all patients will have big increases in their CK levels, but it doesn't mean your muscles are falling apart. It just means that the, the natural CK that's around is not getting cleared. So it's common, but generally not a problem. There's no symptoms or, or danger from having that. Um, rashes across the board, people tend to get rashes on these drugs and then muscle and joint aches. So for imatinib also, they have more diarrhea and count suppression, which fortunately we don't tend to see in these other, in these other drugs. Um, next slide. So hepatotoxicity, that's a big fancy word for liver damage, which is what I was just talking to you about. And this is just a quick slide to kind of focus on, um, on the risk of this. And so again, at the end of the day, you know, the concern here was that different liver enzymes were potentially elevated. Um, there was one patient who had high liver enzymes for over seven months. Um, and there were a couple of patients, again, not with TGCT, um, that had sig significant liver issues. And so this is why um, we in the United States have developed something called the REMS process, which I'll talk to you about on the next slide, please. So another patient question here to kind of talk about this more. So why did Europe not approve pexidartinib for TGCT when the US did? 
So it's all about this risk benefit ratio. And they, the way they looked at it was that the liver toxicity risk um, potentially outweighed the benefits that were seen. And the US debated that as well, but ultimately they used this REMS registry um, in order to be able to approve it safely. So what's a REMS registry? Basically, if you go on Teralio or Pexidartinib, your doctor has to register in this electronic system and you have to register as well. And what happens is for the first um, weeks that you're on PEXI, your doctor will have labs drawn and we have to actually upload those labs proving safety and that your liver is okay to this REMS registry. And so it's a way to make sure that everybody's paying attention to this risk of liver issues because if you catch liver inflammation early, you can stop the drug very quickly and the vast majority of patients will respond. But it's also just important to have that extra level of surveillance so that we keep people safe. Next slide. Why do these drugs have so many side effects? Um, this is another patient question. And so the reason is that all oral pills in general are not perfect. So imatinib is certainly one that hits a lot of different targets. And as, although PEXI and DCC are more specific, there are still other proteins on the surfaces of cells that the puzzle piece can fit into, maybe not as well, but it can be enough to cause um, side effects um, because of these other toxicities. So you're not just hitting macrophages, you're not just hitting the tumor cells, but you may be hitting other uh, normal cells as well. Next slide. Is there a way to decrease side effects? So most side effects are manageable with other medications or some lifestyle changes. So things like nausea, we can usually get on top of it pretty well. You know, from my own experience in, in treating patients with PEXI as well as DCC, you know, I think the hardest thing for me to deal with is the fatigue and probably the swelling because for most types of swelling, you can potentially use water pills to kind of help get extra water off people, but that doesn't work for this type of swelling. It's fluid being in the wrong place and blood vessels being leaky. And so that I think is probably the most challenging thing to work on, but work with your doctor. We usually see better side effects with dose reductions, meaning reducing the dose of the medicine that you're taking. And usually it doesn't impact your ability to have tumor shrinkage and improvement with your symptoms. Next slide. What is the likelihood I'd respond? So these are a bunch of busy slides here, but basically the take home is there's different types of response. So you can talk about a shrinkage rate. So a response rate or a partial response means a shrinkage of more than 30%, which is a really high bar for this type of tumor. Um, and then you can talk about the clinical benefit part of it, which Dr. D'Amato talked with you about the range of motion, your stiffness, your pain, all of those things. So imatinib was about a 19% shrinkage rate for more than 30%, and about 75% of patients had stable disease and high improvement in symptoms as well. But this was not formally evaluated like with those the questionnaires and things that she showed you. Next slide. Um, pexidartinib, so this is the waterfall plot. So a waterfall plot is basically showing every patient that was on the trial as a little bar. And you can see the Pexid group on the left side and the placebo um, on the right side. So if the bar is going down, that means that the tumor diameter also went down, the length of the tumor. Um, and that red bar, orange bar shows that magic 30% cutoff. You can see this is pretty impressive. Almost all patients on Pexi had a decrease in the size of their tumor. So that's what led to the approval. You can actually skip the next slide because Dr. Gemato covered that. Um, so we should be looking at DCC 3014. So this is um, the abstract again that was presented at the CTOS in November. Um, uh, 22 patients were evaluable with this new drug. And again, these are waterfall plots, same type of thing. Every bar represents a patient and they were treated with different doses, which is what the different colors stand for. But everything that says PR is below that magic 30%, everything else is decreasing in size. So again, really good evidence of activity in this disease. And on the right side of the screen, you can see um, that some patients were on the treatment for a long time, 16, 18 months even for the patients who are on the longest. Next slide. 
Similarly for cabiralizumab, um, this was also a very, very early report um, that was at the ASCO meeting in 2017. Um, they only presented on 11 patients, but five of those 11 patients had that magic PR partial response or 30% shrinkage. Um, and again, with pretty good side effects. So this study is sort of, um, we're not entirely sure where this is going either. Um, so unfortunately, although this looks promising, we'll need to follow up more. And I think when Dr. Damano pulls the recent then upcoming trials, um, we can talk about that in more detail. Uh, next slide and last slide. So just a couple more things on 3014. You guys had asked a lot about, um, about clinical trials and, and you know what, what do I need to know about eligibility? So we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more. For DCC 3014, in general, patients going on these drugs on trial should have highly symptomatic disease and disease that's not removable easily by surgery. So this is not for somebody with their first diagnosis who just doesn't, who is, doesn't wanna undergo the surgery. Like these really need to be patients that don't have standard options because again, the, the surgery cure rate or can be you know at least 30 to 40%, particularly for, for small, well-localized tumors. Um, there are other safety concerns. So you have to have good liver, you have to have good counts um, and so on. And they also require again, that you have some degree of pain or discomfort because they're also monitoring um, outcomes uh, as far as improvement that goes. So when you, if you decide to, to look at these trials there's a whole list of things that your doctor will go through with you about eligibility but those are the big picture ones. And uh, Dr. Wilkie, there was a question. If someone, I had liver issues with Teralio, does mm -hmm. that make me more likely to have liver issues with the new drug? With DCC? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's the a great question. Are allowed to still be on it. They can still be enrolled in the trial, mm -hmm. um, even if they've had liver issues with the with Teralio, as long as it's cleared up. Is that's my understanding? Is that your understanding too? That's my understanding. You are yeah. eligible if you've had it previously. There's a separate cohort, a separate group of patients that are being looked at. Um, the questions we don't know are, are you likely to respond? Um, is it going to work better for you if you're, if you didn't have good response to the other drugs previously? And certainly the liver issue, you know, I would be watching really closely. Um, but overall, I think uh, we, it's more something we need to explore in more detail. Okay. And then finally, how long will it take for it to be approved? We don't know if it will be approved because we need to do the bigger studies. Like I said, handfuls of patients have been treated on this. They're planning a phase three trial. So we we're looking at probably several years. Um, so those were my slides. Um, Dr. D'Amato, uh, I will okay. turn back to you. All right, well, um, the rest of my slides are actually just questions. So I'm gonna go over some of the questions and um, let's see, I want to try to minimize this so I can see the questions and no, I can't see the questions. Okay, let's see. Um, so can I, stay, can I stop taking Teralio? Are these lifetime treatments? So, you know, that's a good question. Um, a lot of these questions, these, some of these answers, we don't know. Um, we do know that um, it, once you stop the Teralio, it can continue to work when you stop it, but eventually the, the, the tumor starts growing again and you be, can become more symptomatic. So at this time, um, you know, is it lifetime treatments? As Dr. Wilkie said, there's a gene that's mutated that causes the cells to be turned on, causes that overexpression of the CSF. We, so right now we're just stopping the signal. We're not going and doing gene therapy. Now, gene therapy is something that's gonna be the holy grail and that's what we're really gonna stop this disease with gene therapy, um, but that's gonna be in the future. So maybe in our lifetime, yes, I think we will have gene therapy, won't be, have to be on these drugs. But for now, we have, we, it's going to be a delicate balance between how symptomatic you are, how much the tumor is damaging your quality of life, and how much the treatment is is damaging it. And so it's going to be, um, you know, something that we're exploring. And I'm going to go over. Um, I'm going to go over. There's actually a clinical trial to answer this question. 
Um, and so um, the preliminary results we don't have, but there is an ongoing clinical trial. And so what are clinical trials? Clinical trials are seeing if you can, there's different various types of clinical trials. So basically what they do is they take a drug, they grow it in the Petri dish and, and have cancer cells or tumor cells growing in the Petri dish. They try the, the drug, it kills the tumor cells. Then they, then they inject um, mice or an animal with the cancer or the tumor. Then they try it in animals and it works. Animals get better and they say, we have to try it in humans. And so when they go to try it in humans, they start out with a phase one trial. And a phase one trial means they don't know what the dose is. Obviously we're bigger than mice, right? So we need to figure out what the dose is. So they start out with a lower dose and they keep going up on the dose. Eventually they find what the safe dose is. But in the meantime, they have a general idea what the dose is gonna be. And they have a general idea of what tumors to look for. But a lot of times the phase ones are for everybody. Once they determine what the dose is, then they go to an expansion or a phase two where everyone has the same kind of disease and they want to figure out the percent of patients with that disease that the treatment works. Then after that, then they have to say, oh, this drug really works. It works in 25 or 50% of the patient. Well, now I have to get FDA approved. And so to FDA approved, they have to show goes into a phase three or a registration trial where they have to show that it's better than either the current treatment or placebo, a fake pill. Okay, and that's what that's what happened with pexidartinib. This was a long time process. Um, we've had this trial at University of Miami back when Dr. Wilkie was here, and she enrolled a lot of patients in the trial. This was phase one and phase two. Uh, it went from one to three. And this has been going on for many years, probably five, six, seven years since they discovered it to the time that they had the trial open, the time they had enough data to approve the drug. So it does take a long time, which is good in a way we wanna make sure it's safe, but it's bad in a way because you know we want these treatments. But if you, that's, so that's the benefit in rolling in a clinical trial, you get to have something that you can get sooner than it becomes available because you can't get it unless it's FDA approved, at least in the United States. Okay, um, and so how do we get clinical trials? Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and I'm just gonna walk you through the process, okay? Hopefully I don't have any um, embarrassing emails or searches, I tried to do that. But anyways, can you guys see this? Um, my website, the clinicaltrials.gov, am I on there? Yes, we can see okay. it. So I go to clinicaltrials.gov. Um, since I'm dealing with one hand, I already typed in the tenosynovial giant cell tumor. If you do TGCT, um, then you'll get some testicular cancer. And you know, obviously women are uh, candidates for that. So, so you have to type in tenosynovial giant cell tumor, and then you go to search, okay? And you go to search. Now you'll get some studies that were completed. So you wanna narrow the search, okay? So you wanna go recruiting. And if you're a little curious, not yet recruiting, what's coming in the pipeline. So I like to see that too. And I go apply. Okay, and there's six studies. So here, Japan, maybe once COVID is done, we can all travel there. CTOS was fun, but they're looking at it in other countries. Okay, so we wouldn't worry about this, okay. Study to evaluate discontinuation and retreatment in patients with TGCT previously treated with pexidartinib. So that this trial is going to answer your question about you know what happens. Is it good to stop it and all these things? We're going to learn a lot with this trial. So then I plug onto it and then I look at what it is. It's going to be the experimental arm. Okay, which is everyone gets the pexidartinib at 300, at 200 milligrams at twice daily. And then we're gonna be looking at um, patients that, that resume or stop, okay? And we're gonna look at different outcomes. They're gonna look at that promise score that we talked about, the percent, the percent by tumor volume, which is the best way to measure 
on MRI and then the eligibility criteria. And then it says all the eligibility criteria. You've had to be, you've, you've, you were already on one of the studies. You're able to complete the form. A female has to be willing not to get pregnant. And then it talks about the locations and it says like not yet rec uh, recruiting and recruiting. So this is a trial um, some, some centers will have. So we'll learn a little bit more about it. Um, then I go back, there is a way to go back, but I, you know, I'm, I'm Gen X, so Generation X. So, you know, I don't know how to go. I have to go back to the main page, but there is probably an easier way. Here's another trial that's coming. I don't know much about this, but it does look promising. This ABX injections, it's upcoming and I don't know what sites it's gonna be. So that's something that I'll probably check like once a week and see, oh, what's got happening with this? I haven't heard much about it. And then we have the DCC. So this is a page, this is the DCC 3014. So I can open this up and I can see it's a multi-center open label phase one, two. So that means there's gonna be two distinct parts, the dose escalation, we're gonna figure out the best dose. And then the phase two will be, so the, the phase one, they let multiple patients in and the phase two is just gonna be um, TGCT patients. So when it says cohort A and cohort B, that means that cohort A means if you've had treatment before or if you haven't had, a cohort means like the like patients are a little bit different, so you may fall into one of those two categories. And they're going to be looking at um, responses, and they're going to be do, having you fill out these range of motion, the pain, and then here's the inclusion criteria: eighteen previous treatments, and then you know it does allow for previous treatments, no surgery. As you know, Dr. Wilkie went over this, and then. If you go down here and it says locations, you can open up and you can see where it's, where it's recruiting and you know that it's okay, it's recruiting and then it has the contact information and here we go. So we're, we're close by, but you can see that. So, so that's a good way, that's a good way to be able to kind of look to see, you know, what's, what's available. You really have to read the inclusion criteria and sometimes it's just too much. So you can be like, oh, I saw this, trial on clinicaltrials.gov and you ask your doctor about it if it becomes a little bit too cumbersome for you. Um, and, um, I th and then how long does it take? So right now, um, so again, talked about um, why we need placebo because the FDA, this is a benign disease. So the, and if you remember from Dr. Wilkie's um, uh, graph with those waterfalls, there were some patients on placebo that their tumors got a little bit smaller by not doing anything. So, you know, we want to make sure the drug is really working because it has some side effects. And the trials right now, the DCC we talked about, the one that we can't pronounce, I'm not, I mean, Dr. Wilkie was very brave to try to pronounce it. I just, I'm going to call it the CABI drug because I don't, I can't even try to pronounce it. But um, that one, um, I think they're in works of trying to come up with a phase three trial. Um, so, but you see it's not available on clinicaltrials.gov. And then how long does it take to get into a trial? Um, so, you know, again, you have to make sure that they meet the criteria. You have to find the center that has it. You have to have the initial appointment with the doctor and then they will go over a list, they'll examine you, they'll check your labs and they do a list of eligibility criteria. But usually once you've been kind of deemed that you're gonna be in the trial, it really doesn't take that long, only a few weeks, which is fine because it's not like this can't, this tumor grows completely out of control. So it is, it, it's a little bit more time consuming than say if I were to just write to Ralio for the prescription, I, you could probably get it in a couple of weeks, you know, maybe one or two weeks where a clinical trial may take a little bit longer, but not anything unreasonable. All right, um, what about, do we have any, I think that's it for the patient questions. Um, I don't know if there was any other ones or if Sydney has some. Yeah, we have some questions while we wrap up a little bit. Um, so one of the questions to either of you is how does COVID affect the trial recruitment process? And do people have to stop taking their drugs when they get COVID? And how does COVID affect that? Um, well, you know, when COVID first came out, um, you know, we were, a lot of centers were just 
were like halting clinical trials. It was really because we didn't know what was happening. You know, they were stopping surgeries, they were stopping everything. Now that we know a little bit more and it's COVID's kind of our way of life, we've, we've reopened the clinical trials. Now, some of the centers are a little bit less staffed. So like, for example, at our center, you know, we're, we, we've lost some, not, you know, we've you know, um, some staff members haven't been able to come back. So we're, you know, we're a little bit of a lull. So some of the centers have um, have halted some enrollment just um, because of, um, to make sure everyone's safe, but other centers they're flying by and, and it hasn't really been affected. As far as if you get COVID um, to stop the treatment um, depends. Um, how symptomatic you are from the COVID, this really doesn't suppress the immune system. So in theory, um, you know, you, you, you shouldn't have an interference um, with it, but likely, you know, it would be depending on, you know, obviously if you're really sick from the COVID, you, want, you don't want any concomitant medication. And if you stop it for a few weeks, likely the tumor is not gonna grow that much. So you can just restart it. But I think it would be a, a case by case basis. Do you agree with that, Doctor? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's we don't know enough yet about how what what immune cells you need to fight COVID exactly, and what these types of drugs are are doing to it. So it's a judgment call. I mean, if you're really sick with COVID, you know, Paramount is going to be managing that, and not probably your TGCT. And so, and our sponsors have been incredibly supportive. You know, for for normally normally if you go off schedule on a trial at all, it's like a huge deal. But our sponsors have been incredible. We've been able to ship drugs to patients out of state so they don't have to fly in to get their medication and to have the assessments. It's been, um, they've been really, really supportive, but it's, uh, it definitely takes a team effort. And I think everyone will be really, really happy when we can loosen up some of these restrictions. So another question that goes right off that are PVNS or TGCT patients considered at risk then? Yeah, I mean, I think anybody who's taking some type of, of chemotherapy or targeted therapy or immune therapy, anybody who is on treatment um, for a cancer or a or using drugs that are similar to cancer drugs, you have to assume that you're at slightly increased risk. I said slightly increased. This is not like if you were losing all of your immune cells every cycle, like you would be on traditional chemotherapy. Um, you know, there's, I have been telling all my patients to definitely get the vaccine when it becomes your turn, or if there's one available to you. Um, I, you know, at least in Colorado, we're very strict about the tiers. Um, but my patients who are on oral chemos will be considered to be on active treatment and with comorbid conditions. So that'll hopefully be our next tier. If that helps to explain a little bit. So also, uh, so since most patients have partial responses, do these chemos actually kill the tumors or just shrink them? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I'll jump in and then Dr. Tomato can can weigh in too. So a lie, I personally think there's, so. There's no way to know 100% without biopsying or doing surgery on these tumors after treatment to know how much is tumor, how much is inflammation. But I personally think at least some part of it is the, the macrophages leaving, the swelling coming down within the joint, and you're left with either tumor cells or probably more likely scar tissue um, within there. I don't think we can get rid of everything completely because we do see PBNS that comes back when you stop these medications. Um, but I definitely think we're controlling it and starving it to some degree. I don't know, Gina, what are your thoughts? I mean, you said it beautifully. I think that that's, I think that's what it is. It's just, you, there's probably still some remnant there, um, but most is going to be dead tissue and the, and the, and the inflammatory cells leaving. Mm -hmm. But with the, because the, the original tumor only has about 5% of, um, you know, the, the neoplastic or the, you know, tumor cancer cell with the mutation mm -hmm. and the rest is inflammatory. So I think, yeah, the inflammatory cells leave and you're up with dead tissue. Yep, I agree. So, and then we'll go through maybe one or two more questions while we still have time is, uh, so patients on these trials, would they have to take holidays in order to get pregnant since most of these people are around, you know, childbearing age in a lot of circumstances? 
Yes. So, um, so that's the one thing. And when, you know, you, you're weighing the risks and the benefits and the quality of life, um, you know, um, a, the, so depending on how bad you, you know, um, you know, your tumor is, um, you know, you can't be on the medications getting pregnant. So you want to be off the medication. You want to be uh, using, you know, one to two forms of birth control when you're on the medications. In the clinical trials, they require two forms of birth control. When you're, you know, that's, it's hard. So you, and you have to really like sign papers to say that, that you're going to do that. So, and that's the same thing. And if you're taking any medication for this, you want to be making sure you're very strict. And then, but if you decide that you wanted to get pregnant, you'd have to stop the medication and then be, you know, off the birth control for, for, for a while, I would say, you know, safely three, three to six months being off of it. And then, you know, probably less than that, you know, um, but, you know, just to make sure it's all out of your system and then, and then you can restart after. I don't, I think that it is still excreted in the milk. Uh, and so you probably wouldn't want to uh, lactate, you know, you wouldn't want to breastfeed for, for a while. Uh, if you, if you go back on it after pregnant, after you're pregnant. Perfect. And then our last question is, so our total knee replacements and removal of the actual full synovium considered curative and why may they lead to also recurrence after total knee replacements or hip replacements, depending on the joint? Yeah, so I'd, I'd love to have, you know, one of our big ortho guys on this on this uh, Zoom to talk about that, you know, somebody like Laura Randall or, you know, who's these guys that do this all the time. So the issue is that the most dangerous or the most problematic TGCTs are these diffuse type. And the diffuse type can extend outside of the joint space proper. So that's where you get into problems is if, you, if these tumors are more extensive than you realize and they're in the soft tissue, then a knee replacement may or may not get rid of enough of it to, to keep you in remission. Um, and certainly hip is another example. I've had patients with hip PVNS where it's all through there and a hip replacement is not gonna necessarily fix the problem. Um, and I have a lady right now who were struggling with that because she thought she got rid of everything, but no, she didn't because the it's, at, it's outside the joint in a lot of these terrible cases. So. You need to review your scans very carefully with your orthopedic doctor before you're considering a joint replacement because there is definitely a risk that it is not going to be sufficient. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we will continue to have multiple webinars just like this. And then if any of the content is really dense or medical jargon, don't worry. We'll have many others that will cover much more in depth of specific uh, terminology and such. And you can feel free to email us. I'll leave an email in the uh, panelists and attendees chat. And thank you all for coming. Thank you, Dr. Wilkie and Dr. Diamato for being here. Thank you.